Welcome everyone. So this session is about plugin server internals and because why not? And uh, what I'm going to talk about here is just give you a small overview of how the plugin server is structured, what different parts interact with each other so that yeah, we all get a better idea. Feel free to at any moment interrupt me and ask questions. And when we're done with that, I'm gonna just, if you still have time, open up two sample plugins and we're gonna look at the code for those plugins. Knowing how the plugin server works, try to walk through them and um, see if, uh, if knowing the background makes the plugin code better or worse or so on. So yeah, this is it. So uh, some of you may have seen charts like this before, which show how, um, Postal Cloud looks like, and I mean, got it from the Postal Cloud repo, so it's all public knowledge here. Uh, but I'm not going to do any of this stuff. My charts are going to look more like this. So um, these were made by with FigJam, in case anyone's curious. So basically, for the context of the plugin server, the main points that are important for us is that uh, we have the internet. Some of you may know about it. And on the internet, all sorts of requests are made by all sorts of people that end up with Postdoc. And all of this goes into the Django app, which then depending on if you're using the open source version or the enterprise version, or soon the open source scale free version, uh, the events will either move through Kafka or through Celery, which is just a ready spec queue into the plugin server. Plugin server does its magic with them, and then the events go on to Postgres and or ClickHouse. It's the shortest level overview. We also have this thing called Celery, which is, uh, I guess you all know about it. Uh, raise your hand if you don't. I don't see any video, so feel free to raise if you do. I, I won't know the difference. Uh, Celery, we still use in the plugin server, and we use it for webhooks at the moment. So whenever we want to have a webhook that runs on an action, then the plugin server still has to make a request through Celery, which is Redis, into the Python application, and it will run the relevant code. So that's the very short overview of this. This is what it actually looks like uh, if you scale it out and you break it down. So this screenshot I took uh, of FigJam and into FigJam I counted as many tasks as we currently had running so uh, at some point earlier today the plugin the entire Postdoc cloud thing looked like that we had 10 Django applications uh, about 44 Django events applications which are split out from Django itself that only receive events then we had nine Celery work orders and three plugin servers. But the plugin server takes four times as many resources as one of these other boxes. So yeah, you can see that everything is to scale, which is a beautiful periodic table of uh, postdoc servers. Um, so this is kind of what our app currently looks like. And um, moving further, if we just go deeper into the plugin server itself, I mean, I guess you all should probably have some idea of what the Django and Celery paths look like and what's behind these boxes. Raise your hand if you don't. Uh, but we have the plugin server. And as you saw here, the plugin server is a slightly bigger box. So it means that it also does more stuff, kind of, probably. And that's true, because inside the plugin server, we have uh, a structure like this. Uh, on a very high level, you have the main thread and you have a bunch of worker threads. And the main thread is the control plane, sort of. And the worker threads are there just to receive tasks from the main thread and to do those tasks. And depending on how many cores in a server, that's as many worker threads as we spin up. So going even more in detail, uh, the main thread runs and starts a bunch of different services that all have something to do with the way plugins work. And all those different services, um, they're either services that we can ask stuff from, 
like for example the MMDB TCP GeoIP service which is a uh, TCP port that we launch into which you can send IP addresses and get as a result the actual address information so the plugin server runs another server on another TCP port where you can ask for GeoIP information so that's this blue box here but uh, many of the other services running on the plugin server are actually there to control the plugin server in some way. And uh, more specifically, they generate tasks from somewhere. And those tasks then uh, are sent to the worker threads for just to be run. And they give the results back to these boxes. So yeah. This entire pool of workers is managed by one service called Piscina. It's the yellow one here. It's yeah, just some node library that we're using. It yeah, provides this worker pool system. And Piscina abstract, abstracts a lot of stuff away from us. And uh, at the end of the day, we just have one function we call with the name of the task and its payload. It gets sent somehow to one of the worker threads that's idle or put into a queue if all worker threads are busy. Uh, the thread does what it has to do to get the result. It replies. And then Piscina, you just basically await for the response and you have it. And that's it. It's a pretty simple way to just run tasks and get the results back. Um, I will go more in detail of the worker threads in the next clip uh, but of the other services running on the main thread the purple one here is the pub sub redis reloads what this is that is a um, very simple channel from the django main postdoc application to the plugin server and by a simple channel you just send an event there and the plugin server receives it and then gets a signal that okay something has changed with the plugins in the database so i need to reload all the plugins that i have and i mean that's it that's the way the main application tells the plugin server that uh, stuff has changed update your stuff so yeah we just send the message through redis and it's a separate channel uh, of other incoming places we have two queues uh, one of them is the job queue and the other one is the ingestion queue and the ingestion queue is the bread and the butter. It's the reason why everything exists. It's the reason why we have jobs, basically. It's uh, the queue that deals with events coming in. So we saw that we have all these event comes in to the Django app and then moves to the plugin server. Well, the event, this Django app is split into two. So event comes into one of these orange boxes and then moves on to the green box and this is the part inside the plugin server sorry this one that deals with incoming events uh i will go into more details about how we process each event as it comes in in a later slide uh, but for now i'll just quickly talk about the other ones uh and this one is job queues i will also talk about these more later but what are job queues these are basically uh, asynchronous tasks that plugins can start and define on their own. So each plugin can say, I support these jobs, such as download latest currency rates. And then uh, a plugin can also schedule these jobs to start at any random point and whenever. So that's that. Or a job can be retry uploads to S3 in the s3 plugin and then the payload is the upload that failed the last time and the job will say that run in five minutes and then it's something you can do so two queues the main queue for the incoming events the queue for incoming jobs then we have a separate scheduler this is responsible for running functions and plugins called uh, run every minute, run every hour, run every day. The interesting things about these functions is that uh, in case one run every minute function is running, then the next minute another one will not be started. 
So if your run every minute function takes less than 60 seconds, it's run every minute. If it takes more than 60 seconds, it's run at the beginning of every minute, considering that the previous one has ended. So uh, this really makes it so that you can be sure that you only have in the entire cluster only one job running at the same time, uh, one scheduled job. So that's that. And then we have the gray box that's actually disabled for now. We have a HTTP consumer, which we are thinking of using for webhooks so that the plugin server could uh, also receive HTTP requests and then do an on request function. And then you kind of respond to a webhook. Sam has a question. Yeah. Hey, Marius. Um, so I don't see the chat somehow. I'm not sure what I can do to see it. So if you have questions, please make noise. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, please. Yeah, cool. Um, I was just curious because you mentioned that you said there's three plugin servers and they each have two worker threads. Does this mean that if, if six different users have tasks that run every minute and they happen to all be doing them at the same time is that's the maximum it can support or am i missing something uh, when you say six different users what exactly is a user um i'm not sure <laughs> in this context right so yeah like i'm not sure like who is dispatching that call to run every minute is that maybe is that just a different service that we control that that runs that or so this run every minute is just a piece of JavaScript you write inside your plugin. So you just do export function run every minute, and then you put whatever code there, and that's part of your plugin. And so, um, uh, I don't know uh, how to uh, explain it maybe more. Yeah, I'm just I'm confused on like when the worker threads get tied up and it has to do work in a different thread. But. Uh, so uh, each worker thread uh, also has uh, a uh, concurrent task setting. So each worker thread can run 10 tasks concurrently at the same time. If a task is completely CPU bound, non-async, then obviously it can basically run one thread at a time because you can't like switch between tasks. But uh, if you have tasks that uh, await for some database response, then uh, you can actually run multiple of them at the same time. And so, um, yeah, you can. So actually, we don't have two. We have four threads inside the plugin server. And okay. we have three of them. So we have like 12 plugin servers running, 12 threads running at this moment. And each thread can run up to 10 tasks at the same time. So that means that uh, if you have uh, 120 plugins that want to run every minute, they will all get their chance. They will, the task will be executed immediately. Uh, even if those 120 tasks will be started at exactly the same moment. Uh, there are a few extra points here though. And I will talk about these red locks in a moment. Um, who can guess what the red lock stands for? Is it red lock? Yeah, it's red lock. Uh, so red lock is a uh, distributed uh, locking mechanism based by Redis. And so it's basically a system with which all the different plugin servers that run can uh, agree upon themselves, which one has to lock at this moment and the other ones don't. And so we use this red lock to uh, guarantee that this service is at once, at any one time, only running on one of these three plugin servers. So um, yeah, the scheduler, and then also the job queue consumer, and I'll explain later why. Uh, we have three plugin servers, but the scheduler is only running on one of them at the same time. And the job queue consumer is also only running on one of them at the time. And why the scheduler is running on one of them at the time? It's because the scheduler is the 
service that every minute says now run this task and if we would have the same scheduler with the same list of tasks running on all three servers we would have the same task run three times every minute once on each server so for that we use this red lock to make sure that there's only one scheduler that's running tasks uh, regarding just how many tasks can run at the same time because we only have one server acting as the scheduler for now that's the only one that actually will be running those run every minute tasks and so that means that it's four times ten tasks that can run at the same time uh, but the rest just get queued in case there is a need so if we have uh, 200 users that have enabled the GitHub annotations plugin that has a run every minute thing. The GitHub annotations plugin takes your GitHub account, checks, uh, sorry, takes your GitHub project, like Postdoc, checks for all the releases, like version this, version that, and then adds an annotation into Postdoc for that release. And annotation that you can see on the charts. So there's like a number in the bottom of the chart. And so it has a run every minute function, I think, or maybe a run every hour. I'm not sure, but for sake of argument, let's say there's a run every minute. Um, so this annotations then will only be checked on one plugin server. And also, yeah, it will be started at one point in one thread. But if we have 200 users trying to do this at the same time, uh, yeah, we'll just start 40 of them queue the next 160 and when the 40 finish or like when one finishes the next task goes on and so on so it's kind of a scalable queue system like that don't know if that answers the question or uh, or close enough uh, all right any other questions about this part All right, so just keep in mind, the plugin server has the main thread, which has a bunch of different services, and then worker threads, which just get tasks and respond. And the tasks are not really of one category. You have like all the different tasks just piled together. Uh, and so you have the different run every minute task. You have the run the on event tasks, but you also have some internal plugin server tasks like flash Kafka messages. Um, side question. It's raining. There's a lot of rain audible. Does anyone hear it or not? Only slightly, but it's not distracting or anything. I'm still going to close my window just in case. Uh, so wait one second. All right. So diving deeper into the worker threads. Uh, it can run a bunch of tasks, but what's actually inside the worker thread? Mm. So a worker thread contains uh, first the Piscina tasks in and out system. So it's able to receive tasks and just reply with the payload. Uh, it contains ingestion logic. This is basically the code where you have an event, you send it to the ingestion code, and then it ends up in your database. So at the end of the day, it's just process event, event, and it ends up in ClickHouse, Kafka, et cetera. But uh, all of this logic lives here. So it's basically another task that can be run in just event. Uh, then you have the plugin VM logic. And uh, there's also a connections object which just contains all the connections to Postgres, ClickHouse, Kafka, et cetera. This is just the implementation detail, but look nice here and the plugin vm logic so how this works uh, i'm gonna skip here in the database we have a few models a few tables for the plugins the main one is plugin and this contains the source for the plugin like the javascript plus all the configuration options or maybe actually a zip archive downloaded from github that contains the source uh, plugin config is a team that is using the plugin. So each team, so you have a S3 plugin, S3 export plugin, 
a plugin config is that specific plugin with a specific set of configuration options, which is per team. So that means you have your AWS key and your bucket name and so on. So that's part of the config. And then the plugin config is also connected to plugin attachments, which are just any kind of blob you can upload. Plugin storage, which is any kind of JSON you can upload. And plugin log entry, which is whenever you do console log or console error or whatnot in the plugin, it gets put into this model. And so all of these in the open source version are backed by Postgres. And in the enterprise version, this is backed by, uh, the logs are backed by ClickHouse. But these blobs are just stored in Postgres. Um, it's, it's fine. Um, and so coming back here, uh, we have the plugin config. So that's a specific team using a specific plugin with specific configuration options. And for each of those cases, we create a virtual machine. And so you each plugin, so each worker thread runs currently all the virtual machines that we have enabled. So for each team, for each plugin used by each team, there is a blue box that is started in the plugin server inside each of these worker threads. So what is a VM? What is this blue box? Find some keyboard. So moving on, what is a VM? A VM is basically something that uses two tools. One of them is called Bubble. You might be familiar with it. The other one is called VM2, which is just a uh, wrapper around Node.js's internal uh, VM system. So Node.js, uh, the JavaScript you run on the command line has a worker thread system. And it also has some kind of sandboxing system and all sorts of stuff. And this VM2 is kind of wrapping it all up in a nice little way, uh, plus providing some extra stuff. So basically what happens, we have the plugin source code that we get from uh, this plugin field in the database. This is sent to Bubble, which we have running in the plugin server. Bubble runs a few transforms on it. So the first thing is it converts TypeScript to JavaScript because Node likes JavaScript. It adds a few custom uh, AST abstract syntax tree transformations for timeouts and imports. And uh, the one for timeouts is a pretty cool one. So we have a for, whenever in the plugin server, in a plugin, sorry, we have a for loop, you can write code that would theoretically break the entire plugin server. You can write a code that for forever, next. And so the loop will just keep repeating or like while true, true or whatever. And what that would do, it would stall the CPU thread no, there's a single threaded process. So the plugin server would just stall and crash and so on. If somebody would write a plugin that just contained the endless for loop. To get around it, we use some magic to edit JavaScript in place. And what we do is we uh, add a, like a const start date equals new date. And we modify the loop so that every time the loop runs, we check if the loop has been running for more than 30 seconds. If so, throw an error. So we use bubble to get around this kind of CPU based attacks that people could run on the plugin server, if it makes sense. Uh, then once bubble is done, the transpiled code gets run in VM2. And uh, uh, in VM2, there are a bunch of extensions and a bunch of libraries that get added to the plugin code. Um, sorry, I'm still gonna ask, uh, the rain is pretty loud for me. Yeah. It's still okay for all of you? Yeah, totally fine. All right, okay. all right. so uh, VM2 gets a bunch of extensions and a bunch of libraries, and uh, all of these are things that you can use inside your plugin code. All the libraries, you can just import them like we would normally import anything, but uh, we whitelist the list of libraries that you can use. 
uh, and you can import them like you would import normally because of this special transform we have here for imports. Uh, and extensions are basically cache, which is Redis, storage, which is Postgres, console, which is just logging, GeoIP, which gives you the IP of, uh, which gives you the location for an IP, jobs, which is not the homage to uh, Apple's founder, but uh, background task system, Postdoc, which is an homage to Postdoc, and also a way to queue new events, and storage again, because you just need to store stuff. Yeah, it uh, should have been once. And then, yeah, we have a bunch of libraries. Uh, these are mostly NPM packages, except for Clipto and Zlib, which are uh, node internals that we pass to plugins. And so when all of this is done, this just basically exports a function with a bunch of things you can export an object with a bunch of functions you can run, and that's it. And if you run them, it goes inside the VM and comes back. So that's the VM. Um, now let's go back here and uh, last two things I want to talk about is the ingestion queue and the job queue. The ingestion queue. So uh, imagine you have a, so there are two types of ingestion queues. We use Kafka and Celery. And if you use Celery, the entire, this is all. Celery gives us one event at a time. And so we just process it and it's done. That's it. When processing one event, it uh, it's in two parts. The first part, we run all those plugins. And then we run all plugins that modify the event. And then the second part is we store the event into Postgres. Mm, what's actually different than what's seen on this chart is that we now have uh, inside plugins, you now have two functions. Before, we only supported process event, which was a function that uh, modified the event. So event comes in. If you return event as it was, the event gets passed on and ingested. If you modify the event and return it, a modified event gets ingested. So that's useful for adding properties and so on. Uh, but it's also easy to just not return and then the event gets dropped. So if you want to make a plugin that just kills all events, make a process event function that returns nothing and you basically have crashed your operation. To get around this, or to make it a bit simpler, we now have also an on event function where you don't need to return anything. The difference is that process event is used for like adding the GUIP information, but on event is uh, more used for exporting things. So you don't really care how long it runs, etc. So the one difference here is that we run all the process event functions here. And then in parallel with ingesting the event into Postgres and Kafka, we run all the on event functions just to save time a bit. Um, because this will anyway usually take longer than the on event functions. And uh, so with Celery, we just run these one at a time for the plugin. With Kafka, it's a bit different because Kafka gives us events uh, possibly in batches of up to 300 or more events. Sometimes the batch size is one, but sometimes it's hundreds. And so what happens then? Then we split those 300 events into chunks of 40 events. And we just run all of this in parallel. Why 40? Because we have uh, 10 uh, threads per, 10 tasks per thread and four threads. So 40. And then if a run plugin task finishes, then the ingest event task starts. And so it kind of plays out. And so we wait for all those 40 threads to be ingested, as for the events to be ingested. And then we send a heartbeat and a commit message to Kafka saying, OK, we got this far. And now we're going to run the next batch, then commit again, run the next batch, commit again. If then it happens that some uh, plugin runs really slow or something weird happens that uh, Postgres is being hammered and just doesn't respond, we also have a 30 minute, 30 second timeout for the entire batch. But if that happens, we basically nullify the entire batch and try it again, the entire batch, or well, from this month, this point on, later. So some events might get tried multiple times or ingested multiple times in this scenario. Um, 
we are working on a solution to isolate these long running ones from the rest. And that's a task for later. And so it should get a bit better. Uh, but yeah, that's how it works now. And then finally, so any questions until now about anything? Or you're saving them for last? I will assume so. So uh, finally, the last thing is job queues. And here, uh, this is still a slightly uh, under construction. Uh, these green boxes are meaning that it's um, perfectly developed somewhere in an imaginary place, uh, but not in GitHub, because that's a tangible place. So, but how it should work is that, uh, so we currently have only the Postgres option. And so we have a job to enqueue, and a job is something started by a plugin. And the job can be upload the next batch of events to my destination, or a job can be try again this upload of this patch to my destination, or a job can be whatever your plugin just wants to do. Uh, so uh, you enqueue this job. It goes to the job queue manager and the job queue manager has or will have a system of multiple job queues and depending on your job it will either go into one of them and each job that we want to in queue first we try the first job queue if it throws we go to the next one if that throws we go to the next one and so if a job so the first queue is the memory queue and how this works is that it might have a buffer of or a limit of only 10 tasks or 20 or I don't know, whatever amount. Uh, if there's a job that should be started immediately, it will go into the memory queue and it will be just started immediately on the same plugin server, possibly even in the same worker thread. But if it's a job that should run 10 minutes from now, the memory queue will just say, sorry, I don't want it and it will be sent to the next job queue, which is Postgres. So tasks that run later, or in case the memory queue is full because it has 10 tasks that it needs to run now and it's configured to not keep track of more, then the task will end up in Postgres instead. And from Postgres, I mean, it's a durable storage, so it will be executed later. Maybe not immediately, maybe a few seconds later, but close enough. And then there is also a fallback in case Postgres is down or throws or is having whatever issue or is full, you never know. We send it to a third backup queue. The main point here is that jobs are used for retries. And so we really do not want to lose data. And so that's why we have this multi-tiered system that if any of the job queues doesn't work, we just go to the next one. And this is just a sample list. We might have a system where we have multiple of them. And if S3 doesn't work, we try another Postgres. And maybe we try a few different Postgreses before going to S3, because S3 is slow to read from. Um, but yeah, right now we just have Postgres implemented, but this is how it should look like. Would this happen to have been inspired by anything? Um, not really, to be honest. Uh, I mean, I was reading at how Segment does things, but they have a slightly different system. And is this something that you think was inspired by something? Does it remind you of something? It looks a little bit like Centrifuge. Uh, I mean, there are definitely differences, but they have the same like tiered queuing system. Mm, okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, we actually originally wanted to build a job queue system called a Cyclotron, and. Uh, why a cyclotron? Because it would go round and round and round. Uh, the idea was to use Kafka. And so you produce tasks into Kafka with a date on when it should run at. Then you have a consumer. If the consumer gets something from Kafka and it should not be run yet, just send it back to Kafka. And it's just going to go round and round and round until the day comes and it needs to be run. So we opted out of it for various reasons, but it was a fun idea. Uh, data transfer costs probably would just kill us. Uh, that's my main concern here. So, um, and so yeah, then to consume from job queues, I mean, it's just the same stuff the other way around. 
Uh, currently, we just have the Postgres queue and we have it dreadlocked for safety. So it's just on one server. So that's for Postgres, we're going to remove the red lock. But for S3 and ClickHouse and BigQuery and many of the other alternative queues that we will make, we will red lock it. And why red locking it? Um, basically, from Postgres and several other sources, they just give us the event when we ask if there's an event, if there's a job to run. But for S3, uh, imagine having multiple parallel plugin servers all trying to read some information from S3 or from ClickHouse. Just knowing you take these ones and I take these ones is a lot of coordination hassle. So imagine we have three plugin servers running and we have uh, entries in ClickHouse. So you say, you take everything where if you divide by three, the remainder is one. You take everything where if you divide by three, the remainder is two. The ID ends with like one or two or three. Uh, but then you have the fourth one coming in, fourth server added, and then you need to rebalance, etc. And so sooner or later, we're going to be re-implementing Zookeeper, and that's not what we want to do. Please uh, no. <laughs> no. So for that to make things simple, because our main thing is data integrity, performance is secondary in this case. Uh, we will redlock the S3 queue, and how that works, it's going to be the dumbest, simplest queue ever, but the point is that the data is safe. And we're just going to upload a file with the timestamp of now and some hash in the end. And then we're going to have a cursor-based reading system. And we're going to have the same for ClickHouse. So it knows that I have read all entries until this timestamp. And so it list me all the files until this, from this timestamp stamp until next. Sort by sending, read in those files, delete them, um, save the new cursor something as simple as that and i mean it's a simple approach that can be used with any kind of input source be it clickhouse be it s3 be it bigquery be it postgres well for postgres we have a better solution which handles concurrency but if you have some kind of cursor based reading we really only care about data integrity and so then we're going to red lock it so that we always know that there's just one server dealing with this at the same time um yeah Possibly as a next step, we might add an extra Kafka queue so that whenever a red locked server reads all these events, it throws them into Kafka into a run now job queue. And that might help at some point if it gets too much for one plugin server to read the backlog from S3. That's, that's when this will become an issue. And yeah, then the job to run and then the job will be sent again to the worker thread where depending on the job, if it's a plugin job, it will find the right plugin configuration and ask the VM to run it. And yeah, and VMs actually are very light. So if you have 200 kilobytes of JavaScript, the VM is gonna just take a few hundred kilobytes of memory and that's it. So um, we can spawn as many of them as we want, basically. Uh, normally we have less JavaScript. The plugin might be just a few thousand lines maximum. So. Uh, I mean, the biggest ones I've seen are like 400 lines. That's the Snowflake export, which is a total beast. Uh, does a lot of magic. Um, and so those things just take uh, meaningless space. So we could launch tens of thousands of plugins at the same time in every worker thread and not really break, break a sweat. Doesn't so, NetDip have a thousand line or something? Yeah, they have a big plugin, but it's just a bunch of ifs. So. And they're just running it once, so it doesn't take much memory. So that's that. Uh, now, does anyone want to talk about questions? Or we're basically out of time anyway, so I could quickly show some plugins, but uh, you can also click them yourself and try to see if you understand how they work. Um, like the new S3 export and then some updates for the session tracker plugin are interesting to see if you want to test your knowledge. On, if you understand how plugins work and what are the constraints and consequences of running this and that. But uh, questions? Anyone? Pineapple does belong on pizza, just in case. Uh, well, if you have no questions, I'll just uh, steal this last minute.
do some fun code. First thing I will show all of you is to install the Octo3 extension because it will just make your life so much simpler and just browse everything. Octo3, you'll thank me later. It's the best thing that came out of the uh, last offsite for me. Yeah, and the second thing you really need to do is to install the GitHub sounds. I don't know if you hear now, but if you hear. So if you install these two things, you're set for life, basically. Uh, wrong place. So yeah, uh, session tracker plugin. This is something which, and yeah, feel free to drop off. I'm gonna go like two minutes over. Um, we have on event. So every time an event comes in, we get here. We skip the session start and end events. We use a Redis to increment a value with a distinct ID. If we are the first one to increment it, session started. We capture an event and we schedule a job to check if the session is over 30 minutes from now. And we also make the key, the one we incremented, expire in 30 minutes. And so now we have this job that runs 30 minutes later. We check if this key still exists. If so, the session is still ongoing because we're still in the 30 minute window. If the key doesn't exist, uh, so if the key exists, check again in one minute if the session is still ongoing or if Redis has expired it, or if a new event comes in, it, the expir expiration date will be pushed forward. Uh, if the key has expired, trigger a session end event. So this is coordinating many different services and making this magic happen. Uh, and the other one, the S3 export plugin, it's also using modern TypeScript. Everything is typed, everything works nicely. To use some kind of buffer system and on events, buffers to send batch to S3, which tries everything. But if it fails, it again calls a scheduled job to run again in the next retry period. So. All sorts of cool things we can just wire together using the primitives we have available now. And we're consistently working to improve this and make things even simpler. So yeah, I guess I'm out of time. So that's that's the plugin server. Those were the internals. I hope you at least learned something. Uh, super disappointed I didn't get too many questions. That means everything was clear. So that's great. Now I have 12 messages in chat to read. Mm. All right. Um, yeah, if there are no more questions, then I guess that's it for me. Thank you for listening. Feel free to listen to it again once the video is out on 200% speed, because that's how you do it. And take care. Thanks, Marius. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.